Hi guys, this is gsnnow.com and I'm here with the review of the OnePlus 8T. So it's the current fall flagship for OnePlus this year. They decided not to launch a Pro model and I think it wasn't a very inspired decision. In some ways, this device actually competes with the OnePlus Nord, even though some of the specs are actually flagship worthy. Okay, so we're dealing here with a beautiful aquamarine green handset. Well, some people call it blue. Anyways, the price tag is 618 euros or around $700 on the rest of the world. And we're dealing here with a phone made of glass and metal. It has the early 2020 Snapdragon 865 CPU, a quad camera, and also a 120 hertz screen. One of the main novelties is the fact that this is the first Android 11 phone we're testing and it's got always on display, which is something new for OnePlus. Okay, so aside from the Aquamarine thing, there's also the Lunar Silver version and also the Cyberpunk version, which I totally love and I would definitely want to get to see. Now, as far as the design is concerned, there's glass and aluminum. This is a glass surface. This is also glass, while on the sides, you can see the aluminum frame, which measures 8.4 millimeters in thickness. The phone is actually pretty light. It's uh, engineered to be very easy to use with a single hand, and I can actually confirm it is easy to use with a single hand. Weighs 188 grams. It's ergonomic. It's comfy, but it's not IP certified against water and dust. The buttons are also pretty comfy. Nice to see. Uh, volume buttons on the left side for a change and we also have this uh, mute slider here which not many companies have nowadays now the display that we're seeing here is a fluid amoled with a diagonal of 6.55 inches and the resolution of 2400 over 1080 pixels it's got all the bells and whistles i'm talking about the uh, refresh rate which is uh, high as high as they get nowadays, well, except for 144 hertz handsets out there. So we have 120 hertz refresh rate here, and you can find them here in the refresh rate area, or you can set it to 60 hertz. We also have HDR10 Plus support and Gorilla Glass 5, but enough about that. Let's actually watch a video which puts the screen to the test. Of course, as you can see, there's the uh, punch hole for the selfie camera which doesn't bother me one bit it's actually pretty small this screen is actually very bright it was pretty hard to tweak it for this filming it's got excellently vivid colors a wide array of colors are shown here the contrast was excellent in the sunlight and the uh, edges are rather small We've got narrow bezels even the chin is almost non-existent compared to other phones out there wide view angles nothing to complain about and the pixel arrangement is of the pental matrix variety now, brightness-wise, this is actually one of the brightest phones ever I've ever tested. It's on the seventh spot, 696 lux units, which is excellent, and it beats several big shots like the Huawei P40 Pro, Asus Zenfone 7 Pro, Huawei Mate 40 Pro, and even the OnePlus 8. Now, it stays below heavy hitters like the Oppo Find X2 and the Xiaomi Mi 10 Pro. But once again, one of the brightest phones of the year, it will definitely remain in the top 10 I find it hard to believe it will be dethroned, maybe by a few iPhone 12s, not sure. And we have quite a few settings here for the screen. We got your sleep mode, your advanced uh, screen calibration with the vivid, natural and advanced options, which have extra options like the AMOLED wide gamut, sRGB and display P3. It all depends on the type of colors you want shown here. We got a reading mode, we got a dark mode and a vibrant color effect, which is basically an enhancement engine. This is about it. I'm very happy with the screen. I find it to be one of the strong suits of the phone. And now we go further and find another one. The powerful Qualcomm Snapdragon 865 CPU is inside. Not much of a difference between this one and the Snapdragon 865 Plus, which is the reason why some companies skip to the Plus version. We have 12 gigs of RAM and also 256 gigabytes of storage of the UFS 3.1 variety. Keep in mind, there's no micro SD card slot here, just in case you were wondering, and uh, it is something customary for OnePlus to do. There's also no lag. It also helps that we have an excellent uh, uh, touch sampling rate of uh, 240 hertz and the 120 hertz refresh rate, the powerful CPU, and also Oxygen OS is one of the most fluid uh, interfaces out there so there's that it's a very fluid experience perhaps one of the most fluid on the market i haven't been saying it just today i've been saying it, it uh, saying this for years now when it comes to oneplus models i feel there's an extra level of fluidity in their interface 
The performance is also top notch, top 10 material in basically every benchmark, the 8th spot in an 2 to 8, in the same time 18th spot in the single core Geekbench 5, 13th spot in the multi core one, beating the Galaxy Z Fold 2, Galaxy S20 Fan Edition 5G, and the Xiaomi Mi 10 Pro. And gamers will definitely appreciate the 11th spot in 3D Mark Slingshot Extreme ES 3.1, beating the Xperia 1 Mark 2, Galaxy S20 Ultra, and the Galaxy S20. Plus. I should probably also mention that we are still below the uh, Xiaomi Mi 10 Pro and the OnePlus 8 as well as the S20 Fan Edition, at least in this test. Definitely top 10 material and uh, as far as the uh, tests for the temperature are concerned, as you can see 38.5 degrees Celsius achieved in benchmarks and in games 35.9, definitely no overheating in this case. We're done with the performance, I'm actually quite satisfied with it. I think it's time to talk about the battery. We're dealing here with a 4500 mAh battery inside this beautiful phone and it charges at 65 watts via wire. It doesn't have wireless charging, so there's that. Let's skip straight to the testing and here we go. Uh, first of all, we tested the video playback and it was crazy. 22 hours and 25 minutes, we've beaten a dozen battery phones and we've definitely even beaten the OnePlus 8 which was crazy earlier this year with its huge amount of functioning time. We beat the iPhone 11 Pro Max, we beat the Galaxy Note 20 Ultra by 10 hours, we scored only below the Asus ROG Phone 3 and a huge battery phone with an 11,000 mAh battery. Continuous usage is also top notch, 14 hours and 8 minutes, just shy of the Huawei P40 Pro by 4 minutes. We also beat uh, other heavy hitters like um, Xperia 5 Mark II. Now even though this may seem impressive, these 14 hours and 8 minutes, we scored below the OnePlus 8 by 3 hours and below the Xiaomi Mi 10 Pro. And the charging is also one of the strong suits, as you can see we're on the third spot with 37 minutes, that's how long it takes to bring the battery from zero to 100% and it's pretty impressive. We only got beaten by only a few, a very few minutes by Oppo Find X2 and Oppo Reno 4 Pro 5G, which are part of the same big company, so no problem whatsoever. After 15 minutes, you're already at 53% and after, well, 30 minutes, 92%, so this is one of the selling points, I would say. On the acoustic front, we don't have an audio jack, but we do have a set of stereo speakers, starting with the one at the bottom on the right side of the USB-C port and then we got the top one here which is also the earpiece so uh, I should probably mention that we also are getting some well options here uh, Dolby Atmos with three main settings dynamic movie and music and now for the music itself let me just find a copyright free music tune that we can play everything feels very fluid on this phone that's one of the main uh, attributes I would associate with. Okay, the inevitable ad is here. Okay, so a couple of ideas. I would say that the volume is quite high, especially for the bottom speaker. The backside vibrates a lot, I would even say too much, especially in the logo area. The bass is okay, but the high notes weren't as impressive. The voice is pretty good, I listened to some rock tunes and I was pretty happy with the results. Just so you know, listen to a lot of Soulfly, Sepultura, Max Cavalera, all that jazz. And you will not cover the speaker in landscape mode, definitely holding it like this, you do not cover the bottom speaker. You don't have to believe me because we usually do tests and those tests are taken with a decibel meter where you can see the power of the volume. For the bottom speaker we have 89.8 decibels and for the top speaker 85.8 decibels. These are achieved the typical acoustic sample that we always rely on and I would say that the bottom speaker is able to surpass quite a few phones like the Asus Zenfone 7 Pro, Huawei Mate 30 Pro and the Galaxy Note 20 Ultra. Still it's below the Oppo Find X2 in loudness and the Motorola Edge Plus. When it comes to gaming 100.5 decibels it checks out everything that's past 100 decibels 
checks our boxes. It beats Asus Zenfone 7 Pro and the Huawei Mate 40 Pro and here we are finally talking about the cameras. First of all the selfie camera is in a punch hole in the leftmost high corner of the device. It's supposed to be a 16 megapixel shooter with gyro aided electronic image stabilization and fixed focus. On the back side things are pretty familiar and we have a main 48 megapixel camera with a Sony sensor I've seen before, the Sony IMX586. So 48 megapixel with optical image stabilization, phase detection autofocus and f1.7 aperture, 16 megapixel ultra wide uh, 5 megapixel macro, 2 megapixel bokeh, yes I know there is no telephoto camera here so zoom will be a bummer. Dual LED flash, 4K 60 frames per second video, uh, the latest version of Nightscape nighttime capture, there's also pro mode, slow motion, super macro and uh, ultra shot HDR plus a new version of uh, better stabilized videos. Okay we also have the proprietary gallery app which uh, OnePlus is providing and let's go straight to the gallery because we have quite a few shots and quite a bit of explaining to do. Okay so first of all it was a cloudy day and generally this would make the colors dull and underexposed. Here we go. So I find these colors to be pretty realistic at first but then as I progressed I noticed some things. So first of all the zoom is underwhelming definitely if you go past 3x there will be a lot of noise and at some point these leaves don't even look like leaves anymore. Uh, Close-ups are solid provided you will take them with the main camera not the macro one which is poor because of the lack of light on a cloudy day and poor because it takes quite a few shots and angles to adjust the closeness to the subject. Now generally I was happy with the colors both in regular mode and ultra wide mode but these are actually natural washed out fall colors. These toys are more vivid and actually I would say too vivid. So here uh, it's a shade of red which is much redder than in reality captured by the main camera and the ultra wide camera makes it worse it turns it into a bright red almost pink. Several more shots. I always keep photographing the same toys in the same park with all the phones I test and this red doesn't check out. I would blame it on the ultra shot HDR option activated by default I deactivated it for better results later on. The focus was top notch, I would once again advise against the macro camera. If you want close ups, stick to the main camera. I mean you can take macro shots but they're not as impressive and easy to take as you would expect on a flagship. Um, definitely pretty solid ultra wide shots even though they mess up the colors a little bit. I'm also pretty happy with what I achieved when it comes to the bokeh capture of this statue. It's pretty well cut from the background. This is a pretty good close up with the main camera and then I struggled with the macro. Fail shot one and once again pretty solid close up with the main camera. Once again possibly one of the best photos of a flower I've taken recently especially on a cold weather and here we're struggling again to properly focus with the macro camera. It is definitely something you shouldn't see on a well flagship because the mid-rangers have been doing it okay. Now check this out. Now these colors may feel a bit vivid but they're actually closer to reality because I turned off the ultra shot mode and the colors well are more decent this time. Pretty nice panorama. I'm confirming to you it was a cloudy day. As you can hear from my tone, I'm not exactly impressed by this phone. I mean it delivers but it doesn't, uh, it's not able to shine like one would expect from a flagship. OnePlus is really lacking that pro model which would have taken things to a new and higher level. Once again here I am struggling to take the close-ups. You're supposed to get about one or two inches close to the subject and the result is pretty blurry no matter how hard I tried. In the end I actually got very close and here we go. Selfies, I also took those. Now you really have to get a proper distance in order not to get your face blurrier than the background but the results were pretty fine I would say. Not the best in the world but still pretty fine especially when it comes to the texture of the face, the skin, the hair, in this case the eyebrows, I'm pretty happy. Also with the focus, it's much better than what I've seen on fixed focus cameras on Oppo phones for example. We also have a bokeh here or two which highlights and accentuates your face's feature and also cuts the subject pretty well from the background. Okay so I think this is all, we actually have several more shots and I actually want to point this to you because they have beautiful rusty fall colors 
properly calibrated this time once the ultra shot mode is deactivated. And here the zoom is quite poor, so you're better off without it. And here I am getting closer and closer to this subject, trying to take a proper macro, and I barely did it. So this is pretty much it. Uh, if you're looking for nice colors, they may be a bit exaggerated. The clarity is okay, details are fine, but in the end we're lacking a telephoto camera, so zoom it out of the question, and the colors are a bit too intense for my taste. It's about on par with the Galaxy S20 Plus, well, uh, minus the zoom. Now, this is the low light capture, this is the series of low light captures. I would say that we have a pretty good flash. This is a photo without flash, this one is with a flash. This is the same bar without and with, so it's solid when it comes to that. The strange thing is that this camera doesn't capture a lot of light and at the same time it creates some weird hues. I spotted some green hues every once in a while, especially in the ultra wide shots and the street light halos, which we're going to see in a minute now, are quite long compared to what I normally see. Nowadays you can see flagships not creating these long lines, uh, but the highlighting of the actual bulbs, so to say, is pretty okay. Also this yellow, which is typical for the low light shots we always take in the same place, is more intense than I usually see in the same market. Here it's a bit greener, so yellow, greener, with the ultra white and so forth, not capturing a lot of light, now, don't get me wrong, the clarity, quality and details are okay, but the long halos and the strange hues kind of spoil the fun. Okay, so enough about that, I think it's time to talk about the videos. Okay, so in the video department I'm going to rely on the MX Player application and, uh, well, not this one, but rather this one, we have quite a few videos and I'm going to start actually with the last ones because they're the most relevant. Here we have the focus test, which is spot on focusing on the foreground and the background and alternating between them is done without a problem. So fast focus, checks out and can easily be compared with what we've seen on other flagships. Okay, uh, let's see what else we have here. I actually have uh, multiple stabilization tests. So there's this one here, which is not very relevant because it's 4K in 60 frames per second. It's not that bad, but once I start descending stairs, you'll notice that there's a bit of steps being missed and the image jiggles a bit. This is without the special stabilization mode activated. Weighted things are a bit better, but even so, I have seen just slightly better with other phones. This is with the special steady mode on. Don't get me wrong, it's not bad, but I've seen slightly better on the Samsung Galaxy Note 20 series, maybe even the Note 10. Okay, and more colors here where we actually test the zoom as well. Once again, very vivid colors, perhaps more vivid than in reality. A decent exposure and change of exposure for the lit and darker areas, although the sky may appear simply white at times. And here we test the zoom. To be honest, not as bad as the photo zoom, even though we're working with digital zoom, lacking a telephoto camera. Okay, uh, let's see what else. We also have a selfie video, which is honestly awful. It's rather poor. Uh, it feels more like a mid-range phone than a flagship. Definitely shaky, definitely blurry at times, definitely not that well focused, so doesn't do justice to the OnePlus name. We also have a beautiful landscape here. It checks out detail-wise, clarity-wise, so there's that. To be frank, I actually prefer the way the OnePlus 7 Pro filmed last year, and now, Let's see how we did in the low light capture. Here we go. Now this is not as shaky as I expected, so stabilization is, I would say, reasonable. Pretty good details, clarity and brightness. So not that bad, but once again the yellow is too intense for my liking. It's as if the yellow has some green slipped into it, making a sort of mustard-like color, not the typical yellow I'm accustomed to. But not bad clarity overall. Okay, so this doesn't feel like a flagship. Nowadays, those super high mid-range phones may pose some problems when compared to this one. For example, the Galaxy S20 Fan Edition is actually better than this camera overall. And also the OnePlus 7 Pro, definitely, I'm saying definitely better. As far as the connectivity is concerned, this little baby has 4G and 5G, a Wi-Fi Direct, Bluetooth 5.1, there's GPS dual band, so you'll never get lost, and also NFC and a USB-C port at the bottom. GLONASS in Galileo would also position you, and Bluetooth 5.1, I think I already mentioned it, but 
doesn't hurt to mention it again. Now the calls were loud and clear, no objection in that regard. And let's see how we did in the uh, speed test. And we actually have it uh, here installed with all the beautiful results. And I do mean beautiful, 479 mega per second downloads on Wi-Fi, 24.9 uploads. This is actually close to the maximum limit I have at my provider. And on 4G, 287 over 39.3, it checks out as a flagship for sure. Now we've gotten to the software and this has been polarized in people for a hot minute now because Oxygen OS 11 doesn't feel like Oxygen OS anymore. Doesn't feel like stock Google anymore. It feels like One UI. All the interactions are taken to the bottom third of the screen. Uh, OnePlus actually focused a lot on the idea of a one hand usage. It's also the first phone from OnePlus with always on display. Nice to see. And here, as you can see, uh, we have the, well, fingerprint scanner, which is actually pretty fast and responsive to my touch. Okay, so there's that, the security aspect, there is this collection of uh, news here from Google. And of course, we also have the navigation with gestures and a semi swipe up for the carousel of applications. There's the uh, multitasking with split screen, keep pressed for the wallpapers, widgets and home settings. These are actually stock from Google. And let's see what else. If you do the drop down, you can already start to notice the uh, well, atypical things. There is a new font here, the OnePlus, OnePlus Sans. There are the new quick settings and the new settings area, which is totally minimalistic. It's all about the black writing on a white background and some red toggles. It's, well, it's a skinny font for sure. And it's polarizing people. Some of them love it, some of them don't. I'm actually in between. I haven't decided actually yet, but I'm loving the interface of my OnePlus 60, my own personal phone, so not exactly a huge fan. This interface has big headlines and smaller fonts as you go through a list. It's snappy once again, but doesn't feel like uh, OnePlus anymore. Now the always on display can be customized, quite a few options. I know there's a lit, a lit, at least 11 of them and the settings area holds quite a few other features. There's the Wi-Fi display, customization, uh, wallpapers, accent color and fonts, buttons and gestures, uh, also security and lock screen, location, digital well-being and parental controls. There's utility. This is quick launch so you can trigger a carousel by keeping pressed the fingerprint scanner and turning it on quick launch. Parallel apps, you can run multiple accounts of Facebook or other apps at the same time. There's a pocket mode, there's the OnePlus switch, quick reply and landscape. There's a game space in a new version, you have it right here for the gamers and uh, you can do several tweaks. There's a fanatic mode, there's the notifications, mistouch prevention, there's also a new version of the Zen mode, there's also the dark mode. And uh, once again, I think I'm forgetting stuff like the canvas and Bitmoji, which let you tweak the experience further. Uh, more will be revealed in the text version of the review. I don't want to bore you. Uh, to bore you, Oxygen OS 11 has been out for a minute and people probably already are familiar with it. Since it's Android 11, it has this new uh, volume menu, which also should allow you to control some of the smart things around the house, or maybe was it the power menu? Anyways, uh, I should also mention that we have now bubbles for the chat applications on the phone and also a special section for the chat related notifications around the notification area and that's about it. So definitely not going to bore you this time and uh, let's go to our website and at the same time reveal the verdict for the phone. Now, I probably mentioned already a few times that it can be a disappointment around the camera area but this phone delivers an excellent display for sure, a superb battery life, a very solid build and a beautiful color. Uh, it's cute looking and light. It has a good performance, loudspeaker, fast connectivity. It's comfy. It has a fast focus when filming, good selfies, good details in videos, 4K, and those are the pluses. On the cons, it doesn't have IP68 certification, no micro SD, no wireless charging, no telephoto camera, so poor zoom by default. The new interface, not a bit fan of it, uh, it's polarizing and some people do not love it. Uh, the bokeh video is a bit underwhelming, I haven't shown you that, but it's a bit hit and miss and buggy and the colors are too vivid in pictures. Also weird uh, green hues in the low light shots. So this is about it. I'm actually founder of the OnePlus 7 Pro in the camera department. Galaxy S20 Fan Edition is also better in the camera department, but this one would end the year 2020 in top five in the following departments. Gaming performance, 
uh, battery life, display brightness and fast charging. So those are the things where it shines at. It's got four things right and one thing wrong, but that can be a deal breaker because it's the camera. So think hard and long if you really want a camera which doesn't have zoom and it's got a hit and miss uh, way of calibrating colors. This is it from gsno.com. Don't forget the price tag of 618 euros for the phone. Once again, gsno.com review this device, OnePlus 8T. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll be back with more pretty soon. Bye-bye.